Um, all right, I'm now going to introduce Janelle Simpson, who works for the Geological Survey of Queensland, and she's going to talk about some modelling outcomes of the ISA Extension Magnetotelluric Survey that she completed a little while ago. Take it away, Janelle. All right, so um, I just want to run you through essentially the, the so what uh, summary of the work that I, I did on this survey. Um, so we're actually unsurprisingly in Queensland, um, out here in Western Queensland, we've got the outcropping extent of the Proterozoic Mount Isa province in Brown. And then um, we've got the younger cover basins surrounding that. So the project area actually sits down here, just to the south of the outcropping extent of Mount Isa. Um, and we're underneath the Aramanga Basin and the Georgina Basin. So we're in some pretty um, greenfields terrain. Uh, in 2014 to 2015, we collected a really big MG survey. So these are the MG points here in this L-shaped array. Um, we've got 18 lines of data. Uh, we've got 800 sites of broadband in the bigger array. So that gives you information from about 200 metres down to over 20 kilometres. And then we've got a couple of smaller infill surveys, one here in the north and one here in the south. So the data is a bit different, still MT data, but it gives you more um, shallow information, but you lose out on the deeper information. We've also got tighter set station spacing. So it's a bit of a balancing act trying to see shallow and deep stuff with this survey. So why, why did we do this survey? It's quite a large one, um, one of the largest ones that's publicly available in Australia. So if we think about the project area, there's been quite a poor um, record of exploration success down here, which probably means we don't understand what's going on well enough. So Mount Isa's got a really strong north-south stripe. So these are macro geological units. So the, the geology stripes north south and should continue undercover down into the project area are actually a long strike from some major deposits up here at Mount Isa. So potentially we should be prospective down here for quite um, exciting minerals, um, but we're not finding them. So do we, are we actually a long strike is one of the questions for the survey. Can we get a better understanding of what the basement depth is so we know how deep we have to look and then what's going on a bit deeper, maybe if we understand what's going on in the full crust down here, we'll have a better understanding of what we might be looking for in terms of minerals. So I've kind of split the talk into two parts. So I'll address the shallow question first because it should be easier um, and then look at what's going on a bit deeper after we've worked out what's going on in the shallow subsurface. So as I like to do, I've defined basement for this talk. So when I'm talking about basement here, I'm talking about pre neo proterozoic basement. So this Georgina basin in here is actually, uh, dates back as far as the neo proterozoic. Um, so all these blue colored units are part of the Georgina basin and the Aramanga basin in pink colors sits on top of that. So we want to see through both the Aramanga and the Georgina Basin to what sits underneath in the Proterozoic Basement. Um, the Aramanga Basin should be pretty shallow here. We're right on the western margin of it. It is unfortunately full of conductive clay and other sorts of siliciclastic sediments. Uh, the Georgina Basin is full of limestone to a, a very high level summary of those two basins. There is already a depth of basement surface in the area and it's, it's quite a new one. So it was done in 2018. Um, uh, if, and we have some drilling in the area as well. So these points here are drill intersects. Um, the, the actual basement intersect is the first number associated with each of the, these holes. And then the predicted depth from the current depth of basement model is in the brackets. So you can see in some areas we're doing a really good job of predicting how far down the basement is. And then in some areas, uh, we have quite a lot of error associated with this. So what's going on? It's not, it's not a problem with this model. It's a problem with the geology. Um, only a geophysicist would ever say that. Um, what's going on is we've got some thick non-magnetic basement units sitting in this area that's making this model um, inaccurate to the basement that we're interested in. 
So can MT actually help us understand what's going on in a more geologically interpretable way? Um, so one of the first things I did is some inversion testing just to see what sort of results we get out of inverting this data. There was some data analysis that preceded this, similar to what NASA was talking about. So we made sure that we were inverting the data properly um, and had a feel for what we might be able to get out of it. So these are just a couple of shallow inversion sections. We're only going down to two kilometers here. Um, and we've got this one here associated with this drill hole. So to a first order, it looks pretty good, right? You've got this quite shallow conductive uh, layer that begins off to the east. And then we've got some sort of two layer basin sitting underneath. It's a bit more conductive at the bottom. And then underneath we've got some resistive basement. So this is very, it's pretty encouraging. This is the actual basement intercept here. So again, it's not quite on any of the layers, but you know, it's in the ballpark. Um, and then if we go to the other place where we've got some drilling control, we've got a conductive thing up here, which um, is in the top of the Georgina Basin. It's not Aramanga Basin this time, so that's a bit different. Um, we've still got this two layer basin structure and then a basement intercept. Again, that kind of sits down off the bottom of the main features of the inversion. So initially promising, but maybe with a bit of um, bit more work to be done. So unfortunately, none of these uh, drill holes that were done by minerals companies had resistivity logs. So it's hard to know exactly what we can expect from the electrical resistivity of the geology in these areas. But if we step a bit further afield, there's a petroleum well out here and a couple of other petroleum wells as well where they've done a really good job of logging the sediments and they've also done some downhole resistivity. So if we've got this geological layering down um, the hole and then we've got this resistivity profile associated with that geology, we can generate a, essentially a pseudo geology, well, a pseudo resistivity model um, of what the subsurface might be in reality. So this is like a synthetic model of what I think might be down there. And then we generate MT data from this and do some testing. So what we're trying to do is work out what MT will be able to resolve from this geology and what sort of inversion parameters are gonna be useful for us. So we did a bunch of different inversion code testing. These are just different one dimensional inversion codes and there's a two dimensional inversion code here. And you can see we're doing a reasonable job of recovering the structure. So if the subsurface is this dashed line, the predicted model is this blue one. So we're doing, we're doing pretty well. So we should be able to resolve what's going on in the shallow basins. But um, if we look at this panel here, uh, the, this is the actual basement interface. We can see that there's a problem. How do we interpret this basement in kind of a sea of blue in one of these inversions or in this big spread of data here. So we need to think about this a bit more again. Um, what we ended up doing is using a combination of the 2D inversion and some of the 1D probabilistic inversions. So this gives you kind of what the average inversion is, but also gives you an estimate of uncertainty. So it's really, really useful if you've got things that you know are not that well constrained. So this is uh, an output from a 1D inversion. So there's this guy here, and that's where they plot on this 2D inversion. So I can pick interfaces out of these 1D inversions, compare them to the 2D inversion, and come up with a cohesive interpretation that takes into consideration some of the uncertainty. So we decided we can actually see three layers pretty reliably from this data in the basins. So this black one at the bottom is the basement interface. You can see there's some disagreement here between the 1D and the 2D. You can talk to me about that after if you want to know what's going on. Um, we've got an intra-basin unit here that sits along the, um, towards the top of this conductive part of the Georgina Basin. And we've got a thin little piece of Aramanga Basin at the top. So we think we can reliably interpret all of these basin units. So if then I compare what I would call, so this is, this is the final depth of basement out of the MT inversion results and compare it, what is electrical basement to what is magnetic basement. 
this is the pre-existing interpretation um, at this drilling location here. We've got the real depth at 600 metres. The best estimate I got out of the MT was about, it's a little bit too shallow, but the error bounds on this estimate are this, this value here at 900 and this value here at uh, 400, which is quite a lot of error, right? But we are doing a, a reasonable job of approximating the basement surface with the knowledge that we're not going to get it right all the time. Um, and then we, we could do better than this if we had some uh, downhole resistivity data from inside the project area, or if um, we had a bit more drilling control at the moment, because it's a greenfields area, we don't have that. But interestingly, even the maximum estimate we get out of the MT data is shallower than the frog tech model. So if we think about what this actually might mean, it's not that the, there's a problem with the frog tech model, it's that there's a difference that we're seeing in the geology. So um, if we've got a shallow, a maximum depth from the MT that's shallower than the frog tech model, what's likely going on is we've got quite a thick package of non-magnetic basement sitting in here. So if we look across the survey, where that might be, that's these uh, hashed areas here. So all of these areas potentially contain shallower proterozoic basement than previously thought. That's kind of the punchline of what we did with the basement study, uh, the basin study. So looking down underneath that now, um, as I mentioned previously, we're a long strike from Mount Isa. So Mount Isa and George Fisher are a couple of very large um, base metal mines for anyone unfamiliar with the Mount Isa region. Um, and the, this large black line here is interpreted to be the western boundary of the Mount Isa property. So the, at least the eastern part of our survey should be within very similar to geology, uh, very similar geology to what's going on further north. Um, but we don't, we don't really know what this, this big black structure is. It's been interpreted. There's some theories about what it might be. We don't have any direct evidence of what it is, or at least we didn't when we run the survey. Um, Zooming in a little bit to look at what's interpreted as the solar geology. There's actually, this is that same major structure that goes down through the MT array. There's um, sediments of the Leichhardt super basin to the east of that, and then significantly older pre Barramundi basement rocks associated with geology in the Northern Territory to the west of it. So there should be quite a, um, a uh, significant difference in geology across this boundary based on the current interpretation. Um, the data analysis showed that it was uh, quite a complex survey and we actually needed to undertake 3D inversion. So we've used uh, MODEM to do 3D inversion of this data. Um, unsurprisingly, again, I started at inversion testing. So one of the reasons that 3D inversion can be difficult is it's computationally quite intensive. So if you've got a really big MT survey, um, you're going to need a really big inversion model and that's going to take a long time to run. So um, that's a pretty serious limitation for getting answers out of a survey like this. So what we did is we, um, and so it, it makes it difficult in general, but it also, um, it makes inversion testing difficult, which means that you're less certain that the final model that you get is a reasonable one. So what we did is we actually did a subset of the data set. So instead of using all 800 broadband sites, we only used about 90 of them. Uh, initially, we subset them back to 10 kilometer regular grid. Um, and then we did a variety of inversion tests. So we changed the data, the input data like NASA did, we changed site spacing, uh, we changed the model smoothing, uh, the starting model, anything that we thought would be useful. And we ran probably about 20 of these uh, course inversions. So in the one I've, I've got is four of the 20 models that we ran. Um, and what we're looking for is, well, initially there's a horrifying amount of variability here for someone who's not uh, that first in inversion modeling. It's not that surprising. So if I start at the simplest model, there's kind of two predominant features in the sky. 
Um, so this is the three profiles out of the model. So I've got this big resistive thing in the east and a kind of moderately conductive thing in the lower colorus in the west. All right, that's, that's not too bad. There's some indication that there's shallow conductivity anomaly that comes up to the surface here as well. So the next most complicated one is this guy. Again, we've got this big broad conductor in the west of the survey. And then this time, instead of just having this vague hint of a conductive feature coming up to the surface, we've got a more defined conductive feature here. And then we can change different parameters, get even more conductive features. We can put in some geological control. So this is out of a seismic line. There's a big dip in the fault here. Um, we've tried to replicate the orientation of this fault in the model, in the starting model, and then let the inversion go. And again, we end up with a conductive feature next to this resistive feature, and then a big broader conductive feature out in the west. So what we're looking for is consistent features rather than ones that come and go. Um, if they're consistent for a range of different models, there's a, a high likelihood that they're real rather than just a model artifact. So from the suite of 20 models that we ran, there's kind of, there's always this big conductive feature in the bottom of the western side of the model, this guy here, he's always there. Um, and then in most of the models, there's some indication that there's a conductive feature in the middle. Um, so taking that going forward, we used one of those pre-existing course models to start up a fine model with all of the data. So this is all 800 sites have been used to generate this final high resolution model. Um, and obviously you can see there's some uh, constraint imposed on this model, but we thought that that was valid based on our understanding from the seismic data. Um, all right, so I've done a bunch of inversion work and then I got some anomalies, but what, what do they actually mean? Um, it's all well and good to run a model, but at some point you have to decide what they might be. So if I think about, NASA showed this one already, if I think about what could be generating these conductive anomalies um, in the shallow crust, it's, it's a fairly easy proposition. Um, you probably got a, have an anomaly related to either fluids or composition or both likely. But as you go deeper into the crust, it gets a bit more complicated. We don't understand what's going on down there as well. So at the moment, there's, there's a, our best understanding at the moment is that increased pressure and temperature is going to increase your conductivity. But we're in the middle of the Australian Craton. It's probably not that much variability of temperature and pressure within the survey area, at least. So we have to look for other explanations. Um, Two common ones that come up in, in the MT space are either hydrogen or graphite. So these are thought to be proxies for movement of alteration fluids through the lower crust. Um, so if you've got hydrous fluids, you're going to get hydrogen enrichment. If you've got carbon rich fluids, you're going to get graphite films associated with grain boundaries, um, both of which are thought to increase the conductivity. If you've got really conductive things in your model, there's other compositional things that might be affecting you, such as presence or absence of fluorine. Um, this is probably not relevant for my work, but it has been shown to be a possibility down in South Australia. So um, generally, generally when we're thinking about these deep crustal anomalies, we're thinking um, either compositional differences or alteration flow. Um, so if I, with that thought in mind, if I look again at a, a slice out of the model, so what I've done is I've taken a slice out of the empty model and put it on top of the deep crustal seismic that was run about the same time, a bit subsequent to the MT survey. Um, this, this, this big dipping west fault was actually um, used in the initial model to help locate this break in resistivity. Um, and then we've got this conductive feature that is spatially associated with this mid crustal fault at the top and kind of probably dies off into this big west dipping fault. And then we've got another big west dipping fault here, and that seems to be 
uh, the boundary of this conductive lower crustal stuff off in the west. So we've kind of got two big bolt structures that control the distribution of resistivity to a first order. So this big structure sits here along the edge of the magnetic high. We've got a conductive anomaly in here sandwiched with this big bolt and then the lower crust in this area over here seems to be significantly different. So this lower crust is a significantly different lower crust to what's going on here. So there's an indication that either this feature or this feature could be some sort of terrain boundary. Um, but of interest to exploration, you've got crustal penetrating faults associated with potential fluid movement. So that's that's an interesting deep crustal outcome from this survey that has relevance to exploration industry. And then if I think a bit broader, so I've got my my little array. It's about 100 kilometers east west and maybe um, 90 k's north south. So if we step out a bit further, how far do these trends extend across the Mount Isa and Maya? Again, thinking about is what we're seeing in our project area similar to what's going on further north to where we know what the geology is. So this is that same model slice. Uh, this is the big currently interpreted terrain boundary. And if we look at this data, so there's a series of uh, profiles extracted out of a 2009 MT survey. These ones are publicly available. There's a, there's a recent paper that uh, got similar results to this inversion, these inversions as well. So it looks like this resistive block on the eastern uh, margin of our survey is actually part of a larger trend that extends up into the outcropping part of the Mount Isa in Lyre, and Mount Isa is about here. So it could all be very similar geology. geology. Um, this lower crustal thing off to the west that's quite conductive. We don't have any data in this data set that tells us where this might go um, to see what the trends might be. But if we look at the recently acquired Auslamp data, so this is Geoscience Australia's uh, most recent modelling from the Auslamp data collected recently. The project area sits down here. Again, this data supports that we've got this big trend of resistive thing of resistive crust under Mount Isa that probably extends down into the project area and then a more conductive crust to the west. Um, and this is of interest because there's been a, quite a lot of work come out of South Australia that suggests that the gradient between resistive and conductive crust in the lower crust is actually important for localization of mineral systems. So if I try and sum up all of that as a couple of takeaways. Um, the MT survey has kind of a shallow set of results and a deep set of results. Uh, in the deeper data, we can see that this conductive anomaly is probably related to fluid associated with faults that come up into the project area from depth. Um, we might have thickened packages of proterozoic basement that are previously unknown from the depth of basement. And um, it's not always easy getting uh, an interpretation out of this MT data, but if you do your best to understand the uncertainty and instead of ignoring it, you can come up with an interpretation that um, might be useful. I think that's it. I don't know how I've gone for time. Thanks, Janelle. Um, so we, we have a, a whole string of questions here. Um, I'm going to ask you one from Wenping Jiang. Uh, do you look at what the common robust features are among all the models using different subsets? Yeah, yeah, so that's one of the primary ways. I think that one was directed at NASA as well, but that's oh, okay. <laughs> probably the most um, important thing in trying to understand what features are robust and which ones aren't. Okay, all right. And um, could you comment on data dimensionality? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a, a difference in modeling approach depending on the data dimensionality, even within this, this pair of studies that I've presented. So in the shallow 
um, basin part of the subsurface, the data only comes, the, the geological dimensionality of that data from analysis is only 1D or 2D. So you've only really got one dimensional or two dimensional structure. So you can model that with a 1D inversion, a 2D inversion. There's no need to throw it into 3D and run a, a, an enormous 3D inversion that's gonna chew up all your computational power. But in the deeper part of the data set, the data is 3D. And so modeling it with a 2D code is gonna give you errors. And I tried it and it, it gives you errors. So it's a horses for courses kind of thing. Understand your data, you'll know which inversion code you need to use.